Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I've been doing a series of webinars during the pandemic to uh, learn something, entertain myself, keep myself busy as if I don't have enough, um, and, and to visit with good friends. And um, I just want to let everybody know we have a contest going on Facebook because the Surefoot pads are five years old, so we're celebrating our five-year anniversary. We're going to have a series of contests over the next five weeks where you can win a pair of Surefoot pads on uh, we'll draw the winners of the contest on Friday. You need to enter all five contests to be eligible for the grand prize of a full set value over $1,000. And if you miss one of the weeks, like if it's week one and you don't come in until week two, not to worry. You can still take all the, quiz, all the um, quizzes, the little assignments for the five weeks and be entered for the grand prize. You'll just miss out on that week's drawing. That's the only downside. So um, go over to Fans of Surefoot, uh, post a picture of you and your horse, tell us why you love Surefoot. If you're not using Surefoot yet, tell us why you want it. We're really excited to be here for five years and even during a pandemic. So we really wanted to celebrate big. Okay, and today my guest is one of my favorite people, Dr. Stephen Peters. Dr. Peters has written a book called Evidence-Based Horsemanship with Martin Black, and this is his third webinar, I believe, Steve? Is it the third one? I think you and I, yeah. Yeah, in fact, you were the first person, I, I think the first webinar or second webinar I did way back when in, in uh, March or April uh, of last year. So you kicked it off and here we are um, coming back and you have told me that you have a lot of new information, which is great. So for the folks that don't know you, Steve, can you just give us a, a sort of a brief bio, like how you wound up studying horses' brains, and then we can get right into your, into your uh, talk today. Sure. Um, I'm a neuroscientist, a clinical neuroscientist. So uh, for most of my career, uh, I saw patients uh, with large neurology practices, human patients, and uh, I, um, founded a memory clinic and a clinic for hospital-based clinic for brain health before my retirement, which was this May. And uh, I've always uh, had horses. And when I would ask certain questions of horse experts, I would get answers that were all over the place, oftentimes diametrically opposed. And when I would say, well, what's that based on? Uh, well, that's the way we've always done it. And so I, you know, I knew what was missing from, from the horse world, at least for me personally, was that I didn't have evidence-based information, information based on, on research, uh, peer-reviewed uh, uh, information. So I started to dissect out horse brains and I, I had seven horses and I knew that wasn't a good sample to generalize out into the world. It, to say anything in science, you need large numbers. So I had to find someone who had seen lots of horses. Thus, I found Martin Black, uh, Martin's uh, fifth generation cowboy. His family has always uh, been around horses and worked with horses. He probably rode a horse before he could walk. He had you know, contract colt starting businesses where he's starting over 500 colts a year. So that's pretty industrious. And he's seen million dollar horses. He's seen Mustangs. He's uh, seen race horses and he doesn't treat any horse any differently because he knows they all have brains and they all have neurochemicals no matter what horse. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. So <clears throat> he had the empirical evidence and, and uh, he comes from good stock. His uh, father-in-law was Ray Hunt, who a lot of people know from the horse world. Um, he was good friends with uh, Tom Dorrance, who came out and worked with him at these big ranches that he used to be uh, <clears throat> um, associated with and worked with. So. Martin would say, I see this happening in the horse. I see that happening in the horse. Um, and I would say, yeah, I understand why neurologically and, and vice versa. I would say, do you ever see this happen? He said, how do you know that? I said, well, I don't know it as a trainer, but I know that's how neurologically, how that would play out in, 
and the way a horse processes. So back and forth, we shared information, his empirical data, my scientific research, and um, eventually he said, you know, we ought to write a book. And, th and thus we did, evidence-based uh, horsemanship. So, so I don't blabber on and on here. That's basically my, my uh, credentials. And um, so today, what we really wanted to do when I talked to Wendy, we, we had talked sort of uh, equine brain functioning 101 the first time we talked. And so much has happened since then. Never before have we ever had uh, neuroimaging like we have now. And I'll show you some pictures that many people have never seen before of really uh, intricate looks at, at the horse's brain. We use things like um, <clears throat> um, EEGs to look at brain waves in horses. We can take MRI pictures. Um, we can now look at, uh, at uh, variable heart rate monitors, which we think may play a good role in, in helping us understand where the horse is in their autonomic nervous system. So the horse is finally really getting a voice in all this. Yeah, you know, even those people like Ray Hunt and Tom Dorrance who said, well, um, I'm, I'm giving you this information, I'm giving the horse a voice, but still it was the interpretation of that person's thinking of what the horse was saying. We're almost getting to the point where the horse can actually tell us what's going on with them. And that's fascinating uh, because it doesn't really jive necessarily with all of our training techniques and the ideas that we've had uh, over the, the centuries. Now I've had people tell me, well, we've been doing this for 50 years. Well, I'm also smart enough to know you can do the wrong thing for 50 years. So just because you've done it that long doesn't mean that that's the right way to do it. And if we're not open to new things, we're just gonna stagnate. I mean, that's how we evolve and that's how science works is that the, we, we stand on the so, shoulders of the next person and then they stand on the shoulders of the next person and we share information. If you go down a wrong path, that's actually good information to have. So other people don't have to go down that, that path. So we're at a very exciting time in, in uh, looking at horses. And some people are even getting to the point where they're saying, you know what? I'm more fascinated by just my interaction with my horse, my, my relationship with my horse more than I am about any performance. So <clears throat> there's a whole new mindset and you can have it all really but I think what we wanna do is use science so that it's in the best interest of your horse and in the best interest of the rider. So that's kind of the picture that we're hoping to, to, to uh, develop over time. And bear in mind, you are all scientists. I tell everyone, do not believe a darn thing I say. You can go look this up, look on Google Scholar though. Do not go look on Google and all this other stuff, right? Google Scholar. I so didn't know about Google Scholar. Peer-reviewed uh, evidence because, you know, one of the things that used to bother me so much is I'd say, well, why does your horse do that, do you think? And they'd say, oh, well, they're a right brain introverted Sagittarius. I got all these charts that tell me uh, this. I think we're finally getting beyond a lot of that, that silliness. And people would say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, <clears throat> if... If you're starting to call your horse names and label your horse, disrespect is one that I really hate. Mm -hmm. Horses, you respect is an abstract concept. They have a, a very rudimentary frontal lobe. They cannot understand these abstracts uh, concepts. They're not, you know, trying to get one over on you and then go laugh with their pasture buddies. Hey, did you see the, the trouble I gave this guy? Right. They're just being a horse. Their brains function like a horse's brain should. If your horse is stepping into your space, you're sending some kind of message that your horse believes it's okay to step into your space. Or you've trained your horse inadvertently to step into your space, but they are not being disrespectful. When you start calling them that, then you're, you're creating justification for punishment. And there really is no role for punishment in your training. Right? Yeah. You do nothing but send them up into the sympathetic nervous system. No learning occurs 
when, when we're applying punishment. All right. Um, you know, and Steve, uh, I just want to say that I think we're in a, a bit of a renaissance because like when I talk to all these hoof care professionals, the amount of information, some of it was there before that we're bringing forward again, but we're seeing this not just in understanding the horse's brain and training, but in their care, in their feet, in many aspects. And it's, I think it's so exciting because it, Horses have been one of those things where we've carried forward myths for centuries, literally centuries. Um, and the benefit, and all the other sports, we use science, right? Cycling, skiing, tennis, golf, we use science. And it's finally, finally getting into the horse world, which it's, it's really exciting to see. Yeah, and it's very interesting that uh, it's a puzzle because it's not just understanding the horse. It's also being aware of ourselves. And if they're a sensory motor creature, they're sensory, they take in afferent information. That means things come into their, their uh, sensory system. And then they uh, send messages out to their motor system to move, to do whatever they, they do. So they're sensory motor creatures. Where are they getting information from? They're getting it from you. So it's not just how the horse processes all this, it's how the interaction of how the horse processes what you are providing. Um, recently, I got a, an opportunity to do some acting. So I thought, well, what I ought to do is, is I ought to do a little research here. So I, I read about Stanislavski, who's the father of method acting. And what he said was that audiences will always know, you know, you have to be congruent. You, 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 your character, their thoughts, their feelings, and their actions all have to be congruent. I don't care if you're on stage drinking a cup of coffee. If you're not doing it congruent with your character, your audience will sense that. So I started to think about how we interact with our horses. And a lot of times there are a lot of incongruencies. Uh, you know, we are, we're not consistent across that spectrum. What I mean by that is, one, our thinking. We might be thinking about something else going on and not giving our full awareness and attention to the, the horse. We may be telling ourselves, you know, I'm brave, but at the whole time we're up in the sympathetic nervous system as nervous as can be. And I've seen these, right? And we try to fool ourselves and also try to fake it till we make it with the horse and the horse recognizes this. So these incongruencies actually create these oh no feelings in your, in your horse. So, you know, things like meditation and uh, exercises to, to create awareness in ourselves so that we're congruent. Um, actually, that's how your horse is reading you when you walk out into the, the pasture. If you don't believe me, Think of the times you just walk out in your pasture and, and hang around with your horses and they just come over to you and you kind of scratch on them. And then think of uh, when you're in a hurry and you're mad at something and you're going to try to catch that horse. And for some reason today, that horse just has this passive uh, avoidance where they just kind of drift away from you uh, to keep that, that bubble. I think this, this question is fitting here. Someone's asked, can horses be opportunistic, testing boundaries, rather than having been an inadvertently trained some bad behavior? And I think what you're talking about addresses that. In other words, uh, it sounds to me like this question is a question of incongruence. I'll read it again. Can horses be opportunistic, testing boundaries, rather than having been inadvertently trained to some bad behaviors? Yeah, yes, and you know, the clearer we are when we set those boundaries, the easier it is for the horse. Oftentimes it's because we are inconsistent. So the horse doesn't know where that boundary is and that actually doesn't feel very good um, to them. When a horse is confused, that just sends them higher up in the sympathetic nervous system. And when they get too hyper aroused, they can't focus on us. So yeah, the, 
the more predictable we are. There's something called neuroception. And in neuroception, it's, it's the nervous system's ability to read threat. And the, what we want is to be neuro, we want to be consistent because if it's, things are predictable, then, then the horse is able to maintain that, that window of tolerance. But when we're inconsistent and the boundaries change and they think, oh no, I'm in trouble for this. Oh no, I'm in trouble for that. And they don't quite know where it is and they're, they're testing around for it. It makes sense to try to figure out where the, the, the boundary is. But if we're gonna put a human label on it, you know, they don't stand still, you know, they're jigging around, they're this, they're that, they're this, they're that. They're not doing anything more than responding to, uh, to us. And how sensitive are they about that? Uh, if you don't know the story of Clever Hans, I'd, I'd tell everybody to go check that out online. Actually, I have some, a slide of Clever Hans somewhere in here. But uh, just basically, it, it gives you an indicator of how sensitive a horse is and how attuned they are to, to body language. And Clever Hans was reading signals that his owner didn't even know that Clever Hans was aware of. Just changes in the owner's breathing rate, et cetera. Um, you know, let me go to some slides actually. Great. I think it might help. Dun, 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 dun. I tried this before. Mm -mm. Can, can people see Clever Hans? Yep. If you just start your PowerPoint, then it'll go big and we can really see him. All right. Awesome. All right. There's, there's Clever Hans with his owner. Basically, <clears throat> what, what happened here was uh, the owner would, would give Clever Hans a math problem and then Hans on this board here that you see in front of him would stomp out the answer. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, six, that's right. And so people were amazed. People came from universities, et cetera, to see clever Hans and study. What they did is uh, they then put a screen in front of Hans's owner and uh, just asked the question, and Hans couldn't answer it. Then they used uh, somebody else, uh, an apprentice, to ask the question. And at first, Hans struggled, but eventually started to get the question, answer the questions correctly with the apprentice. What they were able to finally determine was that what Hans was doing, we wasn't using a big frontal lobe to figure out math problems. What he was doing was watching very astutely the, uh, the professor. And so something would change in the professor's voice or in his breathing. When, when Kant would get close, five taps, six taps, seven, boom, and Kant would stop and that would be the correct answer. Once they found this out, it was a huge scandal. They said this was a fraud and clever Hans was forgotten. But they should have actually put his name up in lights because <clears throat> Hans was recognizing things that acutely in, in, the, uh, in the examiner, in the human. Here's an experiment I want to tell you about <clears throat> to, to also show you how aware horses are of, of us and how subtle we can be with their sensory system. They did an experiment where they took a lot of novice riders and they took a lot of experts and they told them, what we're gonna do is we're going to have you walk into a barn. We're gonna close the doors of the barn. You're gonna be on your horse. We're gonna come at you opening and closing a golf umbrella. And we just want you to be prepared to respond and control your horse, whatever you have to do when we, 
we do this experiment. So they took the novice writers and the, the other writers, they took saliva samples, they checked heart rate. They took a number of measures of their stress levels uh, of both the riders and the horses. And they took blood samples from the horses as well. They walked the uh, subject on their horse into the barn, closed the doors, and they didn't do anything. Didn't do anything at all. They just stood there for a moment, then took them out of the barn and checked their cortisol levels, their blood pressure, their heart rate outside of the barn. Here's what they've discovered. <clears throat> the novice riders all had an increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, higher cortisol levels. The experts, expert riders who felt they could handle the situation actually had lower heart rate, uh, lower blood pressure. <clears throat> but what was interesting is the horses, the horses didn't know what the experiment was all about. The horses of the nov novice riders also had increase in cortisol, increase in blood pressure. The experts' horses, they all maintained uh, throughout. So those horses were so aware that they were picking up the signals of stress in the rider that transferred to them, although nothing happened. And you couldn't tell from just looking at the horse that, that something was going on internally, but they were still registering off of the, off of the rider. So <clears throat> what you can do is you can start to practice with your horse to just see how attuned they are. And there are a couple of people, uh, Warwick Schiller's one, I think Mark Rashid does this to some extent, Wes Taylor, a few others. They, they've been experimenting with <clears throat> uh, things like even asking permission of your horse before you do something. Warwick talks about moving into the shoulder of the horse and the horse tips its head as though it's concerned. So instead of just typically putting your arm up and continuing to move in, he stops and he waits for his horse to lower its head below its withers and relax again. And then he tries to step in again and he just watches his horse. <clears throat> and the horse isn't training him, <clears throat> as some people think, to stay out of that region. <clears throat> Basically, he's giving the horse what's called an internal locus of control. The horse has some say so <clears throat> in what's going on. And just by that factor that this isn't happening to the horse, but the horse has some back and forth interaction in, in say so, <clears throat> he moves pretty quickly once he gets in and the horse maintains their, their uh, equilibrium. Let me show you something here. Yeah. Homeostasis is the word I'm, I'm looking for. Sorry to bounce you all around with this. No, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, somebody's saying, I don't know if you've read a book called Horse Speak, Steve. Um, yeah, I know, I know, <clears throat> I have, uh, and those are interesting techniques for sure. Uh, well, and her, her concept of zero, which is basically inner calm when you're around the horses. Um, and I think we're seeing that in a lot of different approaches, like the Tellington work, um, Sharon Wilsey's work, what you're talking about. Warwick Schiller. I, I met him last a little over a year ago, and he was getting into meditation, which was really interesting. Um, yeah, it is. I'm trying to see if I can. Uh, yeah, in fact, you and I were with. Uh, oh, with Sharon. That's at, right. I in forgot. Oregon. It, yeah. And you know, I'm and there are, it's, it's interesting because that concept, somebody's just making a, a concept. It's who is Warwick Schiller? He's a, a Western trainer. Um, the, but the concept of um, uh, asking as opposed to telling or demanding that um, acknowledgement of waiting for a sign 
it, it, you can see that again, we're starting to see similarities and ideas coming from many different places that are going in the same direction. I'm gonna to try to do my slide. I'm just gonna do my slideshow right from the beginning. And I think that that way we can. We'll and I think on. Steve, what your piece does, your piece gives us the anatomy and physiology and uh, as to why these techniques are working because by understanding yeah. what the brain can and cannot do and how the horse takes in information, it explains why these techniques work. Can you see my slide? I can't see you anymore. Nope. Um, have you have you done screen share? And chosen your your little window? Be back out. Share screen. There we go. Ah, okay. Yep. <clears throat> do you want me to make that bigger for everyone? Yeah, if you start your slideshow, it'll get big. Okay. Get from start. Okay. <clears throat> there we go. This is what we're really looking for. Uh, you know, we talk about training a horse, but what are we training a horse to do? I mean, horses can already walk, trot, low, gallop. You know, um, they can do these things. We direct these things, but they can already do those things. Really, what's most helpful is, is looking at this more as a neuro exercise. And what we're looking for, that green window that's in the middle there is an optimal zone of arousal. We need to have some sympathetic arousal or our horses are not going to pay attention to us. You know, they're going to passively avoid us. They're going to look over the, the side of the round pen. They're going to pretend to, to eat grass that's in front of them. They're going to want to check out, check out what's going on with their buddies over the way. So we need to continue to bring their arousal level back to, that can be as easy as, as kicking the ground, shaking the lead line, uh, just movement can bring them back to us. And so we're constantly working with what's called a reticular activating system, like a radar that's trying to focus in on us. And, it, and I'll show you that in a little bit. But this optimal zone of arousal, you see the last line there says new learning can take place. So this is where we need to be for the horse to actually be learning from us. If we go too high in the sympathetic nervous system, uh, we get hyper arousal. And at this point in time, the horse is getting close to kicking in fight or flight. Uh, they're looking for an escape. Uh, they're too ar aroused. You know, like in an inner city school, a kid can't pay attention to, to his math teacher if he's worried some gang's gonna beat him up and they're waiting outside the window for the bell to ring. So there's too much arousal. Also hypo arousal, if this class is right after lunch and uh, the, all the guys in the back of the room are falling asleep, you, you're not going to have any learning take place in this state of uh, hypo arousal either. The cool thing is, is that in learning to titrate with your horse, I'm not talking about desensitization. That's flooding. I'm not really interested in that. I don't think you should be necessarily either, where your horse checks out and, and ignores everything. What I'm talking about is your horse being aware of everything, but not having to kick in its self-preservation. So it's aware of the dog that runs by barking. It's aware of the other horses, but it doesn't it's inhibiting its self-defense. It doesn't have to go there. Uh, flooding, desensitization, and I can't even believe that, that some people are talking about this thing, learned helplessness, as if it were a positive. It's actually a cruel thing. It's a horse will totally check out, dissociate, <clears throat> um, and appears calm on the outside. Well, we know their immune systems are hurt. They're, they don't thrive. They get sort of this dead look in their eye. It's, it's really not where we want to put our horses. If we're going to have an interactive relationship and, and a conversation with our horses. Yeah, and I, you know, I always give people the example of um, when I had to go to the airport, I would go into that, a semi-freeze state, like a slushy state, 
where I kind of check out just so I can survive going through the airport, masses of people. Um, and there's a lot of school horses that are in some slushy state. Now, you know, we can debate whether or not that's good because they have to, they're school horses and they have to be able to tolerate a lot of stuff, but that freeze and, and learn helplessness is, is in my opinion, as I agree with you, definitely not where we want our horses because what I see, and I'm sure you've seen this, is when, when they come out of that freeze, they come out in a bad way, typically. Yeah, um, yeah so that's that horse who, who may go into that freeze and that's their way of coping. Uh, but it's almost like we put you on a, we have you blindfolded or dissociated and you walk out on the high dive uh, and, you, and you just kind of aren't aware of everything around you. And then we take the blindfold off and you go, oh crap and you come apart so somebody you know my horse has been okay for a year and then all of a sudden they exploded on me there almost never is all of a sudden yeah. you know with the nervous system you know something led up to that and we'll 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 talk about that and we'll talk a little bit about polyvagal theory as we get around to that as well and basically <clears throat> With humans too, in learning, a key point is, are you safe? I mean, in our society today, that's a question we ask each other all the time. We have to ask ourselves, am I safe? Do I feel, do I feel safe? Well, horses even more so because everything is a predatory threat to them unless proven otherwise. So we have to constantly answer that, that question. Let me give you an example of, of how your horse asks and how you, can, how you can answer that question and what happens when you don't. You may just walk out in the pasture as I described and, and get your horse and you start to walk through a narrow gate. Your horse pauses for a minute and you recognize that your horse is a little uncomfortable. So you wait for a minute and let them maybe graze a little bit and then you kind of bump them through and walk through the gate and you you're going to go on a trail ride with your friends so uh, you bring them over and uh, tie them to the trailer <clears throat> and they seem a little nervous so you just give them a, a moment to reset because they'll always reset to homeostasis if we give them time that's one of the things that trainers really neglect the best tool you have in your toolbox is the pause and because people are so worried about getting every last minute of training in, um, they neglect probably their best tool of, of all because horses need time to process things. We know this from looking at MRIs with humans the same way. You need time for reflection and to assimilate this information. Otherwise, you end up with bits and pieces and the horse is trying to put those together. And so the potential for confusion is really great. And as I said, once they get confused, they start to get into the state of hypo arousal and then we lose them. You've lost them when they're up their sympathetic nervous system. So you want to help them titrate and the more comfortable they feel, you take them out of their comfort zone a bit and then let them reset and up and reset. And pretty soon you're opening this window of tolerance where Martin Black says, I have special forces horses. I don't know what I could do now because they, they've learned that carrying around this uh, sense of safety, <clears throat> once they learn it's portable, you know, and, I, and it's amazing. You'll watch horses that, that they'll reset their nervous system. You know, um, they'll do a little something that, that will help them come back down if we give them time. If we don't put the pressure, increase the pressure. <clears throat> so, our horse a little nervous, so we let them spend a little more time rubbing their vibrisi. Those are the sensory organs. Those are not whiskers. That's why it's illegal now in a lot of countries. France just recently joined the, the crowd of shaving those off the, for what we think are cosmetic reasons. You know, a mayor shouldn't have whiskers. Those are sensory organs. The horse knows where its face is, where its eyes are. Those are in blind spots that help the horse. <clears throat> so we let them explore the saddle pad. We put the saddle pad on, we put the saddle on, we take our time. We let our horse put their head down. 
Same with entering the trailer, they halt, they halt for a moment. Instead of get after them, <clears throat> we just let them reset. Each time they're asking, am I safe? Am I safe? Am I safe? And by, with that pause, we're saying, you're okay, you're fine. Uh, and, and if you get some licking and chewing, that's really what you want. <clears throat> licking and chewing is not the, this magic thing. Some people say, well, you know, what can that mean? It occurs because the ninth cranial nerve is uh, linked to the salivary gland. <clears throat> and its sole purpose is to activate, reactivate the salivary gland when the horse is dropping down into the parasympathetic nervous system, when they're relaxing. So when they're, when they're not relaxed and they're sympathetic, their lips go tight and their mouth goes dry. So what we're, it's the, one of the best signs we have, you know, other signs, the head goes below the withers, et cetera, are good signs. Uh, but that's an excellent sign with that licking and chewing that they're getting more parasympathetic arousal. They're getting calmer. So let that work for you instead of fighting with your, your horse. So your horse gets on the trailer, you get off the trailer, you meet up with your friends, you ride by this big boulder, your horse really pays no attention to it. It's just moving along at a nice pace. <clears throat> Next week, you're a half hour late for meeting your friends and you decide to check the mail and you got a bill you thought you paid and now you're all pissed off. So you march out into the pasture, man, I got to hustle. And your horse, for some reason, doesn't feel that comfortable with you. So it's keeping its distance. So it takes you twice as long to catch your horse. <clears throat> you walk your horse up to that little place in the gate, but you don't have time for messing around. So you are coming, bump, bump, bump. I'm gonna whack you on the tail with the end of the lead line. You're getting through here. So the horse has asked you, am I safe? And you really haven't answered that question. You hook them up to the trailer. They're jigging all around. They know something's up. You, you hurry up because you're in a rush. You throw the saddle pad on, you throw the saddle on. They're still dancing all around. They're asking you, am I safe? Chemically, what's happening is an area in the horse's brain called the locus ceruleus is pumping norepinephrine into the brain. You would know that as, as adrenaline or, yeah. So it's pumping this into the brain and it's getting, you're filling that cup higher and higher and higher. Then your horse hesitates for a moment at the end of the trailer. You yank them in, spank them on the butt. They jump in, you tie them up. They're still jigging in the trailer. You, you pull in, you see your friends are already down the trail. You hop on your horse, you ride past that boulder. Now your horse spooks, turns its head sideways, starts to buck. And you think, that stupid horse that's been around that rock so many times, but it hasn't been around that rock full of norepinephrine and having that signal now go quickly through the amygdala, an area that's related to fear. So we actually have a different horse. If you and I go to the movies and we see a comedy or a drama and we're talking about it afterwards and we go to the coffee shop <clears throat> and uh, yeah, we have an enjoyable time and we get a lot of dopamine and we get oxytocin from interacting with each other. If I, you go to a scary movie alone and it's late at night and it gets out at 1130 and you decide to cut through this dark alley to go home and all of a sudden you hear the trash can get kicked over behind you and you jump out of your, you were not saying, well, that's stupid human. You know, they've been to the movies before. They've been down this, this alley before, but not under those circumstances. You're chemically somewhere quite different. Now, if a horse is as sensitive as clever haunts to every little thing. And now we are on that horse as well. You know, who's responsible for the reason that that horse uh, spooked at that rock? We never answered their question. You know, am I, am I safe? That's a vital question to the horse. <clears throat> yeah, I love the movie example. I, I cannot go to scary movies. I can't. <laughs> I have nightmares, you know. I I... Like <laughs> you know, the, 
being the evidence-based guy, and that's been my whole career in neuroscience, uh, in some ways that puts a box around you because you follow protocols. And I only answer questions when I say, well, yeah, I know for a fact, because this is based on this many studies in peer reviewed journals, et cetera. But being retired has allowed me to take a look at other things, to sort of think outside the box. So uh, I've been doing that a little bit and looking at, at, at different brain theories. And one is that everything vibrates and resonates at a certain frequency. And so can we pick those things up in, in our interactions? Well, some science would say that you can, you know, women who live together, their menstrual cycles slowly start to come closer and closer together. If you set a bunch of metronomes out and start them out at different rates, eventually they start to get a little closer to one another in their rhythm. So there's something, even in inanimate objects, it seems that there's some sort of energy out there. So not to get too woo woo about this, but we think that may be happening to some extent that <clears throat> allows animals to move and send signals that they can pick up from each other. You've watched flocks of birds, they just move this way. And Martin has, has said, you know, I watch this with horses all the time. I try to get out of my horse's way and I try to get a feel for my horse. And then once that happens, it seems like the horses all sort of have this synchrony that they can get into this, this rhythm. And if we're tense and we're, you know, demanding of our horse, are we in this sort of conversation? And it's amazing if you watch horses, you know, just as a large group, if you've ever gathered a large group of horses together and maybe led them back to the barn where they're going to be fed, watch how many of them are seem to be on the same lead. Watch how one will just turn an ear and, and simply move in a direction. And they all seem to be able to pick this up without, you know, they're not crashing into to each other. So there are theories that say, if you can sync your communications, in other words, if you, the more things you can synchronize <clears throat> and what I talked about earlier, thinking, feelings, actions, having purposeful actions, you know, not being incongruent in the way we, we interact, you know, um, your horse knows you're afraid no matter how tough you talk, right? I've seen people in clinics now, you know, where Martin will say, you know, don't clamp your legs on your horse and don't pull your horse's head like that. And they'll say, I'm not, I'm not, you know, and, and the head of the horse's head's all yanked around where we lose awareness of where we're at. So the, it's, it appears that the more that we can synchronize messages, even on a neuronal basis, the clearer the communication, the faster the communication, the more effective uh, the communication. Um, so, uh, I just wanna ask if you've heard of heart math. Yes, yeah. Because this, um, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time uh, working with heart math. I used to put my students, um, I put the unit on my students with the earpiece and have them ride. And I'd watch because I could see the lights on the unit and I could watch it when they were in what's called heart coherence, the light would be green. And it, it was yes. fascinating to do that because you could see how the horses and the people really started to get things together and that anxiety level dropped and decisions were made that weren't um, you know, thinking busy brain stuff. It was more like appropriate action. Yeah, it, it, it is interesting. My, I have a friend, uh, Virgil DiBiase, he's a, he's a uh, neurologist and he's done a lot of work with variable heart rate monitors on horses. And so we found some interesting things. <clears throat> so, you know, after the horse lowers its head and starts to lick and chew, it takes a while for that heart rate monitor to indicate the same thing. So that horse is only starting the process, you know, 
we actually probably should wait even a little longer to allow that horse to, to reset. That may only be the, the beginning. Um, one of the things Martin did uh, in talking about the getting these pauses together to get things more synchronized, he said, you know, I'm so efficient and I'm worried about that when I train. And so I, I'd, uh, I'd wanna spend every moment training. But then as we've done this research together, what I find is if I take five horses into the round pen and in an hour's time, I spend maybe 10 minutes with this one. He said, it's good because there's five horses in there. So they all just based on the, the interaction and the oxytocin and the herd provides its own protection. So they're less likely to be way up in the sympathetic nervous system. He works with one for 10, 15 minutes, works with another one for 10 minutes, works for another one for 10 minutes. He looks back and he's got two other horses there that are now relaxed. He said he finds <clears throat> that those horses, all five of them, move along much quicker and do much better in their rates of learning than if he spent an hour with each one individually. That's really interesting because most of the time when people work in the round pen, they have a horse in there who doesn't have any buddies, really. Right, right. And we don't allow time because the owner might come ask the trainer, well, have you been riding my horse this whole hour? Right. You know, and a friend of mine, Wes Taylor says, his neighbors look over the fence all the time and say, they actually pay this guy? He just stands around looking all the time, right? Which is probably more effective. I've had engineers tell, you know, come to my seminars and say, well, how long do I wait? Like, is it like 1.5 yeah. minutes or is it like two minutes? You know, your horse will tell you. And, and Martin answers that question by saying, if you think you waited long enough, then wait a little longer, basically. So that's where we can give the horse time and allow some of these things to, to connect. Because what damage do we do if we just override? We just don't pay attention to what our horse is telling us. And we're just going to make them do things. They'll do things, mm -hmm. but they'll learn in a rote way. And so we're not creating the same sort of brain that we create by allowing the horse to develop this window of tolerance. And here you see actual pictures of neurons. When we stress a brain, we are pruning back all those dendrites, all those connections. So we really want the horse to be Can able to- Can you go back to, to that slide for one second? Absolutely. I just, I just want to make one point. Last night I had Dr. Joyce Harmon on and we were talking about ulcers. And she mm -hmm. said the biggest cause of ulcers is that the horse is stressed. And what we need to do is to be able to start observing uh, changes in our horse that indicate stress if we want to avoid ulcers. Yeah. So, you know, this is just backing up that idea. If, if we've got stress in the brain networks, it's showing those signs of stress. We can definitely see that come out in the gut with ulcers. And that's interesting because our management techniques alone can cause stress. Yes. You know, if horses aren't given access to forage, if we stick them in a sensory deprivation box, which I think out on the East Coast they call stalls. <laughs> Yeah, uh, those kinds of things are highly stressful for, uh, for horses. So it's not just, you know, yelling at your horse or, or whipping your horse with a, with a whip or, or putting pressure on your horse. It can even be the ways that we think we are lovingly taking care of our horses can create significant stress. And, and of course, different horses, just like people have different levels, uh, tolerances. Um, Absolutely. You know, we were referring to my horse, Al, who's, he's a very grounded guy. And so not a lot upsets him, whereas a, a very sensitive thoroughbred type might, you know, the same kind of environment might be very stressful. So we have to figure out what's stressful to our horses, what is not stressful to our individual horses. And it, and it can vary quite a bit. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, same as with people, there's all kinds of individuals. But what we realize is that we all have brains. Yep. We all have hearts that pump blood. We all have you know, certain levels of chemicals. Some people can tolerate lots of stress. Some people very, 
very little stress. Um, so you're exactly right. But the idea is we don't want to cause unnecessary stress if we can help it because it's in the best interest of all of our horses. Yep. Right. Yeah. Let me see if we want to look at this busy slide at all. We're going to skip over oh, it. Oh, okay. Because I want to. Look <laughs> I like was excited over. about it. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> so we looked at this window of tolerance, and and something that's really caught on is polyvagal theory. It's been around for a while. Dr. Stephen Porges is the is the person who originated this thinking. Um, it's, it's allowed us to expand our idea of what we thought was just fight or flight. Now we also know that there's freeze, which is, is another component of all this. <clears throat> when the, here you'll see in the green, when the horse feels safe, and as long as we can answer that question for the horse, am I safe, then they can stay engaged. They can stay connected with us. They can, uh, we can maintain their attention. If the sympathetic arousal goes even higher, we haven't answered that question. We're starting to look at defensive strategies, fight or flight. If we block those, those avenues and the horse feels life threatened, then they can shut down. They can actually just freeze and become immobilized. The way to think about this is, let me see if I have a slide for that. Well, is this. <clears throat> the sympathetic nervous system is the gas pedal. So if I put too much arousal on you, fight or flight is you're going to stamp on that gas to get out of the situation. What's called the vasovagal response, that's the horse's ability to tap the brake. So if the horse is allowed to reset its nervous system, it can tap the brake. That's the vasal vagal uh, response. So they can parasympathetically develop emotional regulation. That's what we want. We want them to be able to feel safe in a number of situations and to practice with that a little bit out of the comfort zone and dial it back down a little bit. And so the ceiling continues to rise where they become more and more comfortable and they're in control. We're not forcing this. We can't force our horse to reset their nervous system, right? So continuous low pressure stress and then allowing the horse to reset, the, the horse can tap the brake. The dorsal vagal response is, is slamming on the brake, totally slamming on the brake. And that's the oldest form of, of uh, defense. It's a primitive brainstem sort of response. You'll see lizards sometimes, they'll just freeze on a rock and become immobile. So <clears throat> we don't wanna step, slam on the gas because we're gonna fight or flight. We don't want to slam on the brake where we're just frozen. And sometimes um, all we're doing when we're restraining a horse is just making matters worse. We're actually causing them to become immobilized or we're sending them way past the panic state because we've taken away fight or flight. Let me give you an example here of resetting the nervous system. Let's say you do ride by that big boulder and your horse does spook. <clears throat> well, maybe one thing you can do, you've heard of these things, the one rein stop. One rein stop doesn't have to be yank your horse's head around like in the cowboy movies where they fall over their front foot and toss you off on the ground. You know, one rein stop can just be a little bumping to turn that horse's head. And if you allow that horse to just move away from the threat, watch them in a pasture when something scares them. They run about 20 yards and they're looking behind them. And once they figure out that that wasn't something to be afraid of, they reset. But if we restrain them, we, we not only are they afraid, but we're telling them you have to stay here. And if you're nervous, then you're both afraid. The ho horse is getting that signal strongly. We're trying to halt that horse. And that's where you get those, they'll just take the bit and they'll bolt. 
Uh, you might get a lot of bucking. You could get all kinds of things. And it's because we restrain them. When we restrain them, we, we make them feel vulnerable. They really feel terribly vulnerable because we've taken away their, their escape. So sometimes just allowing them, you can just trot or, or jog out on a big circle. And by the time you get halfway around, some of that energy is, is gone and allows your horse to, uh, to reset. So we, we have an Okey interesting don't. question. Um, if you're with a horse that goes into a yeah. freeze state, what can you do? Like say a horse has gone into a number of things mobilized. Yeah. And you're on their back? Uh, either on the ground or on their back. back. Yeah. If they're in a free state, just let them alone. Look for that licking and chewing, no matter how long it takes. You know, a nice thing to do if your horse is in a frozen state, they're not going to eat when they're frozen. You know, you can put grain right under their nose and you know when they're they're really way up there in the sympathetic nervous system. They're not interested. They're interested in survival. If they've gone to that point, really just back off altogether. No signals. Don't ask them to do, to do anything and just wait for them to come out of it. Look for that licking and chewing. Look for the, the tendons in their face. That's another real good sign. You'll notice when their lips are tight and their jaws shut you'll almost get like that guitar string tendons popping out of their, their face. And they can look fine. They might be still and people say, oh, look, they're just, they're just relaxed now. Look for and let their head drop down below the, the withers when they're frozen. Sometimes it's even better to move though. Let's say they're frozen next to that big rock. So you could get off your horse and you could just uh, slowly lead them away from that rock and turn them in a big circle and let them move their feet until they're more uh, relaxed. Uh, the thing to do though is not like some people who say, well, you know, they're frozen, so I'm just gonna use the crop. They're frozen, I'm gonna use my spurs. Uh, uh, they may not do anything, they may just stay frozen or yeah, you may just be pumping norepinephrine, you're pumping gasoline, onto the fire and look out for the explosion because it could happen uh, from that position. The good part is they'll always reset if you, if you pause and give them time. That's the way their nervous system's designed. It's uncomfortable for them to be in fight to fight. It's uncomfortable for them to be frozen. It's uncomfortable for them to be in constant flight bolting, right? So that's because their nervous system is so full of, of that chemical mix. Another way to get around uh, this is, is we'll, we can become good at resetting the chemicals. And this is what Martin and I determined Tom Dorrance was good at. He just didn't know the names of the cocktails he was mi mixing, but you know he could take nervous horses and get them working in a calm window. He could take those that, were sluggish and get them, bring up the life in them without sending them up to the, the top. <clears throat> Curiosity is huge in a horse. Curiosity will toggle back and forth with fear. So if you can get your horse, give them times to check things out. Let them have their head and explore things. Let them use their lips and their vibrisi to, to explore. <clears throat> That's a big dopamine hit. In fact, let me go there. Well, we can look at this just to give you a picture. These horses are in their parasympathetic nervous system, heads down below the withers, they're grazing. This is actually, this doesn't mean the horse is out of their comfort zone. So some people say, oh, I don't wanna get my horse too riled up. This is where your horse probably needs to be. Their attention is with you. You know, their ears are, are on you. So you need a little bit of sympathetic arousal. The kid in the back with his head down on the desk, not paying any attention, is not going to be in the best state of learning. Here, we're going higher up the sympathetic nervous system. You see those tendons I talked about in the horse's mm -hmm. jaw here? The eye widens. to, to You'll see more white. It wants to let in more light and take in more information. Looking in the horizon, not for what's right in front of them, looking out on the horizon for an escape route or to see if there are any more predatory threats. 
Look how tight those lips can clamp shut. And then you can get panic. If you kept that for a horse who was panicking, you can actually create a trauma. And then now that horse is a rehab horse. That's different. You've got a different problem then to deal with over time if, if your horse gets traumatized. <clears throat> Serotonin, I'm just going to talk about briefly because what happens when we pause? When we pause, we allow horses to reflect, assimilate information, and their nervous systems to reset. So we allow more serotonin to, to influence the horse's brain. Why is that important? Look, it, it's in charge of mood, fears, anxiety, relaxation, mental focus, learning ability, clarity of thought. Look at, if we've got a chemical like that, we wanna tap into that if we can. One of the best ways to get there is to allow these pauses in between learning. You know, young horses that have this short attention span and we try to force them to pay attention to us without putting these little breaks in there, we, we send them up in the sympathetic nervous system and we lose out on this good chemical we could add to our training. This. <clears throat> I said the horse is a motor sensory creature. Most, and that makes them easy to deal with in terms of, all right, when can they sense something, right? So I send them a signal and it gets through to the motor system and they respond. So we have this nice operation. <clears throat> A little bit of, of the stimuli, just a little bit, less than 10%, travels very quick. It travels quicker down the low road to the amygdala. And the amygdala is, is basically a structure that we associate with fear. And then we're going to get an emotional response and we're going to get our blow up. So we want most of the information, if we can, in that window of tolerance, traveling the high road. They take the, the stimuli in and they do what we want them to do and everybody's relaxed and it's predictable. <clears throat> can, can you go back to that diagram for a second? Yeah. Okay, so you've got the sensory cortex going down to the amygdala. Can you just explain that loop a little bit? So on the high road, it's gone to the sensory Yeah, that's cortex. just, uh, think of the amygdala. Yeah, so it's actually being processed in the brain versus in the amygdala is in the brain, but it's, it's a more immediate response. So all, what happens if information takes that low road, it closes all the, the repertoire that the horse has learned, closes the door on it, and all they're left with is fight or flight. Okay. If it gets up to the brain, then they have all these things that they've learned previously that they can respond to. But I'll give you an example. So you're, you're practicing side passing with this horse and everything's going well and you put the signal on lighter and lighter and the horse seems to be picking it up and doing what you want. But now it's a windy day and there are other people around and you're in a new environment and your horse's attention is, is everywhere and then there's a loud noise. Eventually you're gonna send a signal to the amygdala and it's gonna shut the door on all that previous learning and the default is going to be that fight or flight. And that's where people say, you should know this. You should know this. You should know better. Yeah, you this, go to that scary movie. Slide. I love you this. You go to that scary movie at night by yourself <laughs> and walk down that alley and let me jump out of, from behind the trash can. Uh, and you jump up in the air and I say, look, you should know better. I'm, I'm not a threat to you. You should know better. You've walked down this alley before not under the same chemicals. Got it. Humans are the same way. Because that's one of the things that, you know, so many people say, I, I, you know, my horse, I've already done this with my horse a hundred times. He should know this. And they get mad when the horse doesn't respond appropriately, but they're ro not recognizing the horse is in a completely different chemical uh, milieu in his brain. And that's why he cannot respond in that way. Awesome. Yeah, instead of saying my horse should know this, at this moment, my horse, something's interfering with the message to my, my horse that they can't respond. Mm -hmm. You know, 
The horse is just going to do what the horse does. Think of our brains as filters, right? So information comes in and it gets filtered through a certain way. Well, if we've got some interference in there, right? It's not that the horse is making a conscious decision. You know, he knows better. Uh, he's just being stubborn. If he's doing what you call stubbornness, there is a reason be behind that. You know, are they sore? Uh, do they sense something out on the trail that you're not even aware of? It can be a zillion factors. Um, but, you know, if we're aware of their nervous system, and that's, uh, you know, really a lot of people, I don't want to be critical here, but <laughs> a lot of people sell systems that are, you do A, B, C, D, E, and F, right? But we're not built that way. You know, every day is a different day. Other factors impinge on us, right? Maybe you need A1, A2, A3 before you go to, to B. Maybe you get to A to C and then you go back and revisit B. But they're all individuals with individual nervous systems and individual variables all playing in on that. So what you really, the more accurate picture brain-wise is that it's an interaction. Every day you're having a conversation with your horse. Your horse is in a different place. You may be depressed one day and happy the next, right? You don't say, well, you know, you should be this every single day. These are not machines. These are neurobiological creatures. And, you know, it's, it's going to be messy, right? It, it's going to, we're going to have to have conversation. It's going to be an interaction, but that's the joy. It's a cerebral thing. And, and that's the joy is this relationship. And if you do this well enough, you open that window of tolerance where your horse is comfortable and able to solve problems even without you. Yeah. Believe it or not. <clears throat> Martin and I came up with this, this pyramid that, that shows this window of optimal learning. And what we're we're getting is this toggle switch between curiosity and the horse wanting to figure something out. And if they do, and we reward them by giving them a break, they get a dopamine hit, which is highly rewarding. And then they get more curious. They learn to learn. They want to figure this out. And, and uh, they start, their learning becomes more accelerated. If we put too much pressure on, self-preservation kicks in and they start to go towards fight or flight. So what do we do? We just back off. And then it, it, there's an art almost to this toggling back and forth where the horse is looking for the dopamine. Oh, well, I'm a little nervous. And then we back off. And the more we do that, the more we raise the ceiling of optimal learning. Um, so I, get... I've had a question about this pyramid since the first time I saw you present it. Why don't you include awareness in optimum learning? Oh, that's probably, they're aware throughout this whole thing, but that is just the different, to make a differentiation between just an automatic behavior, such as, as uh, where they start to become aware of everything around them. And that can happen even with grazing. Um, so we probably should change that because there's awareness going on until you get up to about the, th the panic area, then your horse loses awareness. That's the horse that self-preservation is so strong and they're so panicked. They'll run into a fence. They'll run off a cliff. They're really, you know, um, so let's just take that block out of there. That's a good observation. Yeah, because, well, maybe. the thing that I've found, and this is from doing Surefoot for eight years now, is that you know, you put a horse on a pad and they look, they appear to be going down the scale, right? They'll look sleepy, they'll look dozy. And then when you go right back to work, they instantly do the thing you've tried for 45 minutes to do that wasn't happening. So there, there's, what I keep seeing with Surefoot is that if I bring them down, they actually can perform the either perform or learn. They get, they get more curious. So that's why when I, whenever I look at this chart, I, from my personal, you know, experience and evidence from using Surefoot, I find that 
the horses that appear more down lower, just above grazing awareness on your scale are actually very present and learn and are and are able to learn. And I think that what I find is most people don't read that their horse is stressed. Even if, you know, and you've said it many times, you know, the horse can be standing quiet and calm, but he's actually stressed when we look at certain parameters. And that's what I keep seeing with Surefoot is that they might look calm, but when I put them on the pads and they drop down, they're able to do whatever the task is much more or learn much more efficiently. So that's, you know, just from my experience. Yeah, we don't know exactly what's going on, but there are tons of stuff we don't know exactly what's going on, but obviously, and, and when he's come out to, to a farm, I used to have in Iowa and stuck all my horses on the surefoot pads. And obviously there are neurochemical changes taking place. They step off those pads. They're not the same horse they were when they stepped on the pads. <clears throat> um, some things that you would suspect would be involved would be serotonin. It's, a, it's uh -huh. the drug that we associate with emotional balance. So, you know, um, self-preservation might be there at first. Um, but there are also a ton of things that we don't know about that we will know about when we can do a functional MRI, a picture of the horse's brain in real time that will tell us more about what's going on. But, you know, and many farriers, good ones, will tell you this. Bob Bowker, who you and I both know, who was in charge of the equine uh, hoof lab at um, Michigan State, right? Yep, he was just on last week, so yeah. Yeah, so there is a ton of, of neuroception taking place through the hooves. You know, the, the hoof can actually talks to the brain yeah. back and forth on a cellular level. So um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And some things happen subconsciously, but you're right. Awareness is. Uh, uh oh, you froze. Is in there throughout. It shouldn't probably be there just as a, a slide. I, I show the dark side here just because, uh, you know, if we never gave, what if we never gave our horse release? What if we truly created learned helplessness? That your horse, every avenue it looked for, for some release, for some relief, for some reward, it never got it. Right, and never got a break. Well, start to now, and then it goes over to the the other side, where these horses just become tolerant and resentful, and or we could put a trauma in there, and now it they're so hyper alert that their nervous system is telling them even safe things are a threat, and they even become paranoid about other things in their surroundings. That, we could talk all day about that. that. Those are rehab horses. You know, those are horses that just have been pushed to the extreme. What I do want to show you, the hippocampus is the structure in the horse's brain, in our brains as well, that's associated with memory. So that would be the same structure where you get plaques and tangles in Alzheimer's pathology. That's why memory is, is, is the issue in that structure. NACC, that's an area called the nucleus accumbens. That is so full of dopamine that, that we get a big boost of a rewarding chemical. In this little bit of frontal lobe, uh, prefrontal lobe, that's PFC there, and reward. <clears throat> what we learn, oh, and one more, SNC is substantia nigra. That means black substance. It's black because with the human eye, when I dissect out that area of the brain, you can actually see the dopamine. It's so plentiful and dense in that area of the brain. So dopamine, we're talking about learning the hippocampus and, and dopamine, the reward. What we find is that if we can prevent, present horses with novel stimuli, right, we can overcome uh, this self-preservation and they learn quickly and they're highly rewarded for it. I just, I'm not a horse trainer, but I experimented with this little Mustang who had had some bad episodes with other, in other areas. <clears throat> and so my only parameters were 
I'm going to look and see the first place my horse becomes concerned. Where does this little horse ask me, am I safe? And I'm going to continue to interject and bring new objects into its environment because it's not the tarp. You may think it is. It's not the boulder. It's not the raincoat. It's where the horse is in their nervous system. If this were true, then you would end up having to bring 10,000 million things in. Oh, my horse has never seen a green tennis shoe. I got to bring that in now, right? It's, it's a portable self-regulation. <clears throat> so what I would do is, is uh, I'd notice the horse just lift its head or cock its ear and I'd stop and pause. And the horse began to recognize that it was getting this time. And so I did the same thing with the saddle pad, brought it in, uh, wait until I saw even the slightest acknowledgement that it was in the round pen with us. And then I'd stop and I'd wait for licking and chewing. Before long after doing it with all these things, <clears throat> I, I had the saddle pad on and the saddle on and was riding this horse and this horse is walking around and, and trotting uh, because I, I knew I was opening this window of tolerance. At any point when that horse said, oh no, if I would have said, well, I'm gonna desensitize you here and here comes the saddle pad again and again, and I didn't give him the pause, I would have sent them sympathetically and I never would have gotten to the point that I got to uh, otherwise. So. One of the biggest tools that you have is creating curiosity in your horse and letting them check out things. So Steve, the, you know, I can't help but think of what your opinion is of these things like Road to the Horse or any three-day cold starting clinic, given what you just told me. I talk to a lot of these people all the time. I interact with these people all the time. I talk to these judges. <clears throat> They basically say, well, we get a lot of publicity for these things. And this is no way that you would ever go about training your horse. And, and the judges say the same thing. You know, there, we want to create a lot of excitement here, right? So we get a horse oftentimes to just zone out on things and dissociate. But you've got to go back then because you've created 25 oh no's in that horse's system. And those oh no's, they carry around in that horse. We know that, that uh, those oh no's can be carried physically. And some scientists are now thinking, even in humans, that trauma may be more physical than it is psychological. That you will become so hyper aroused and your neck muscles will tighten and you'll break out into a cold sweat and your heart will race and a zillion things can happen so that you're actually responding to physiological changes in your body. I talked to Jim Masterson who does a lot of body work and he'll say sometimes, you know, I'll just be working a horse <clears throat> and this horse isn't injured, but I'll work on an area that they seem to guard. They have a brace for some reason. And so, once they, they let me know that, I back off, I give them time, I wait for them to lick and chew, and I go back and I play with that area. And sometimes that horse will just, ah, and the owner will say, I've never seen my horse so relaxed. And sometimes they'll even lay down and they'll begin yawning again and again and again. So what happens is uh, in three days, <clears throat> you can create a lot of those little braces and hide those from the, the audience. You can get horses that, that don't have time to uh, trust. It looks pretty exciting. Wade Black, Martin's son, has, is actually, he's gonna be in the, in the road to the horse. And in the qualifying to be there, you know, he stopped a number of times and said, that horse has had enough for today. And he seemed to sort of fall behind when he said, you know, that was good enough. I think the horse understood and was in the right frame of mind. I can't do any better. If I do more at this point, I just create more of a problem. And, you know, like on the third day, he really excelled, uh, but appeared to be making no progress the first two days. But it's boring. The audience yeah. doesn't want to sit and watch somebody uh, just sit there with their horse and, you know, make a cell phone call, you know, uh, and allow that horse to, to 
to process. So it's a, it's a fault situation. It's not the way you would train. No one would tell you, go get a Mustang for, and, and in three days, your Mustang is good. You're going to be able to take your shirt off and, and crack a whip on their back, et cetera. So no, it's not. It's an artificial situation. It's done to create crowds and get excitement. People make a lot of money. They get, you know, recognized for that. Um, it's not a good model for showing people how to interact with their horse. Okay. Um, I do have a question uh, that's been sitting here. It says, how do you decide if a horse who has a noticeable change of behavior toward consistent excitability for an extended period of time might have a medical issue that has caused the chemical change? So in other words, how do you determine good if- point. Yeah. Well, yeah. So you can have them checked out by your vet um, and to see if there's some pain issue. Pain alone causes tremendous stress, right? That can easily send you up in the sympathetic nervous system. And, and then you can get chronic pain where the pain, you know, gets masked after a while. And, you know, horses are made that way, that if there's chronic pain and they can't escape it, uh, the best strategy for them evolutionarily wise is to hide it because in the herd, they would be seen as a vulnerable animal prone to attack from predators if they looked like they were hurt. So you, you have to be aware that, gosh, is this a pain that's been there for a long time? I just haven't recognized that they're hiding. So yeah, and then that can make chemical changes. I, I used to have a clinic and right next to my clinic, this for humans, was a sports medicine clinic. And they'd have athletes come in and they'd get hurt you know, mess up their knee or whatever. And then they would have physiologically recovered, but they would still walk a certain way. And so the, the physician would tell me, look at these people, they, they are healed, right? They're not feeling pain anymore, but they have built in a brace. They're still protecting themselves psychologically. So yeah, your horse can create braces and to, to, it's stressful for them to let go of that brace because they think, oh, I'm vulnerable. So in small increments, you have to answer that question. Am I safe? Am I safe moving this way? Uh, am I safe in this maneuver? And you might have to, it may take a while and you may have to come up with 10 good experiences for them to change, but they will change. What happens in, in uh, a changed behavior <clears throat> is that your horse has constructed brain circuitry that runs that circuit. So you can develop a bad behavior and every time you get in that circumstance, that's the behavior that happens because the circuitry is already set up. There's already a highway there. So your task is to set up a footpath and then slowly set up a dirt road and then slowly pave that road and you will with a substance called myelin. So you keep under low pressure, moving in a different direction, doing something different. And before you know it, and you don't go down the other way, when you start to go down the other way, you stop and let the horse reset. And then you keep going in the opposite direction, so to speak. After a while, this road won't be maintained it'll start to fall apart and the road that you're using, and I'm talking about roads in the brain, right. their, their neuro circuitry. So you, you actually are so powerful. I wanna let you know that you can make your horse so smart because all you need to do is rewire and show it other options and you'll create new brain firing. But if you force that horse to stay in the sympathetic nervous system, if you recognize that they're uncomfortable and don't provide an alternative, um, then you'll get the same behaviors and you won't be able to create these new avenues. So it really is all about safety, all about comfort, all about moving slowly, all about pauses, all about giving your horse an internal locus of control so that they feel they have some say so. <clears throat> what do I mean by that? You come to a stream, your horse has not had many water crossings. 
your horse hesitates. Well, you can have an external locus of control. I'm pulling your head up, I'm putting the spurs to you, I'm catching up with my friends. They say, come on, get that horse across, right? That's stress. I'm, like I showed you that stressful dendrite. I'm trimming down the dendrites. I'm dumbing down my horse. I'm getting my horse across, but there's a cost to that. And then my horse, the next time I come to a stream, I got the same problem. You know, I've got the horse that's still just sympathetically aroused by that. Or I can tell my friends, oh, my horse is telling me this is a good lesson for today. So guys, go ahead on. <clears throat> I let my horse lower its head, one. It gets binocular vision, so it gets depth perception. They, they have eyes on the side of their head, but they overlap in front. So the horse has depth perception in front. When they lower their head, they're getting a, a feel for what the terrain is like. They might stomp with their hoof. They might turn, want to turn away from it. So you just kind of put them back and reface them up, but you don't fight with them. And slowly you might get that horse to move into the stream and on. When you come back around, you try it again. The horse has internal locus of control. It, it knows that you're going to give it a little bit of time to explore. A week later, that, that stream is nothing. The horse that you forced over that stream you may still have that race in there. But you have to fight them across once again. So, so in answer to, this is a big long about way to answer that question. What you wanna do is slow down, give your horse some internal locus of control, know that you're doing this rewiring and just be, be patient with it and you'll make progress. So somebody's asking, with your horse's nervous system. Um, do the old paths ever completely go away or can it be used again in the future even when you think the circuit is gone? <clears throat> yeah, good point. It depends. It depends. <clears throat> if that circuit is not used anymore and the horse has three or four other options and it's been highly reinforced, been given a break and realizes, aha, I got relief when I did that. You took your leg off. You know, you gave me my head, you, you stopped and paused. So I got some relief and dopamine is down that avenue. They really don't wanna go down the other avenue. But let's say trauma's involved. You, something bad, you took that horse down that path and something bad happened, right? They really sent it way up in the sympathetic nervous system. So that amygdala has actually supercharged that experience. That's in memory, it's almost etched in memory, like post-traumatic stress disorder, like the Vietnam vet who's walking along the beach in Florida and there's palm fronds and the news helicopter comes over. It doesn't feel like Vietnam. They actually feel like they, they actually think they're in Vietnam. Their nervous system responds as if they're in Vietnam. <clears throat> so, Things that are similar to that trauma may cause your horse to go down that same path again. And you may need 500 good things to happen to overcome that one bad thing to get around that. And you may never get around that. You may just have to work around it because they may still go down that path if the situation is similar enough to what happened to them in the trauma in the past. Age of the horse you, matters too. The older they are, the more difficult it is to build these pathways. Yeah. Have New you pathways. heard of a book called Explain Pain by David Butler? I have not. It's a great book. He's, David Butler is, a, uh, he's at, I think it's Sydney University and he, he has a group called Noe Group. I'll put it in the chat. Um, but he has this book called Explain Pain and Explain Pain Supercharged. Um, his model for pain I, I actually put fear in there into the same model of, of how we have to get off that wheel and build new possibilities so we can choose different pathways to get out of chronic pain or chronic fear. Um, and um, as you're talking, it just keeps reminding me of that book. So I'll just put it here in the, in the chat. Number 37 in my Amazon book list. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, because they've been doing a lot of research on chronic pain. And basically he says it's all in your head and, but you get this dripping of brain chemicals that keeps you in that wheel, that just that same chronic pain wheel. And you have to build all these exit ramps and the exit ramps are choices, right? And we have to have multiple ways to get off the ramp. So, you know, like something as simple as, you know, when I'm in pain, can I move my eyes so that it redirects and brings in movement. And I, you know, it, again, we keep hearing these themes. I know with um, polyvagal theory, I had, um, I work with guys, uh, I was working with um, wounded warriors who were 80 to 100% disabled um, at a ranch called Horse of the Sun in, in California. Um, and one of these guys was talking about how um, this whole thing with polyvagal and Stephen Porges, that you need these repetitive movements that are, you know, not overtaxing. And he talked about how way back when in, you know, Roman days when these guys had gone to war and, you know, killed all these people, they had to march home. And so the slow walking and then cleaning their swords every night and then slow walking to another camp and cleaning their swords was how they reset their nervous systems so that when they got home to their families, they could actually be with their families. And what we do is we take the guy out of theater in Afghanistan and in 24 hours, drop him in a minivan with his kids and expect him to be okay. <laughs> yeah, movement plays a huge role and movement's part of our nervous system, you know? And when we brace, you know, we're actually sending signals to our, our brain that, that get reinforced by our, our body movements. Interesting in that I, I looked at some PTSD research and the Israeli army seemed to have really low rates of, of PTSD. And what they found was that immediately after trauma, immediately afterwards, they're taken to a tent and debriefed and they have to talk about what happened. They have to describe how they were feeling. They have to indicate that they have an awareness of what was going on in their nervous system. Um, and so it loses its poison, you know, so where we found our mistake was just saying, okay, the battle's over, you're right. You can go home on leave but you've encapsulated all this and now you're haunted by it because you kept that box closed and haven't opened it. So yeah, if you think you've created a trauma in your horse, <clears throat> um, probably the more time that's gone by without addressing it. So, you know, my recommendation would be just small increments of safety and other avenues to rebuild new pathways <clears throat> uh, right away to begin working on it. Because once that, that pathway is set, if you don't give an, an alternative, you're, you're pretty much stuck. And the horse is too. The default is to fight or flight. Yes, somebody's asking a question um, that if a horse was abused by a person, for an example, in a black hat, would you start working with them by wearing no hat or a white hat or a different shape hat? Or are you trying to create an environment totally different from the trauma producing environment and gradually work toward a similar environment? What we find and I, I have to disagree with Temple Grandin here. Who, well, actually, no, I don't disagree with her, but she had said, you know, uh, she noticed uh, wearing a black hat that the horse had been abused by a cowboy who wore a black hat. Yeah, you can have some associations that are, are built in, but more important with that is, is uh, allowing the horse to, to learn to self-regulate. Um, so when you notice the slightest changes in the horse where, where there's arousal, answering that question, am I, am I safe? Because then, let me give you an example. <clears throat> there's a horse that had a, a traumatic experience with a trailer and then uh, got abused and, and getting onto the, the trailer. And so I've watched... Warwick, I've watched Wes Taylor, I've watched a number of people who, who actually, instead of making 
trailer loading the exercise because we always are, we're so task oriented. They'll say, all right, what we're going to do is that we're going to go out and we're going to find out where your nervous system first responds to moving towards the trailer. Oh, your head came up right there. That's a good place to stop and allow you to set reset. Now let's back up and let's go again. Where does your nervous system first tell me that there's an issue for you? Oh, there your ear perked. I'm going to stop right there. And it's this slow interaction. And then curiosity sort of kicks in. You've answered that question, am I safe? And I've seen people who, who on a first loading ever with their horse, once they've answered that question and they haven't put a ton of pressure on and they let them graze and they let them take their their hoof, their front hoof and, and tap the front of the trailer and then take it off, that eventually the horse just walks onto the trailer. I mean, it doesn't know that, the, that that's a scary thing necessarily, but we've all, and then what the horse has learned is that not only did I not have to freak out, but this is portable. This is portable. What do I mean by that? <clears throat> We did work with cows um, and we, Martin and I were looking at low stress cattle handling to help people so that their cows are not all freaked out and crashing through gates and, and stuff. And <clears throat> they're herd animals, so they're safest in the herd. But unfortunately, a lot of people will, will put so much pressure on and yeehaw and think it's like a cattle drive that they've seen in the movies. Yeah, yeah, they make it so stressful. All those cows want to get out of the herd. So, so then they're having to chase them all around. And, and a lot of young guys like that. They think, oh, this is what it's all about. But if you just move slowly, get the cattle to, to mull together, move as a unit, as a herd, move them to a new pasture and stay with them um, until they all reset. They start to move apart. They start to graze, etc. And what they've learned is that this is portable. I can take this comfortable feeling because if we put on pressure, they wanna go back to the last place they felt comfortable, back to the old pasture. And so they'll, they'll run down the fence, they'll pace back and forth. Uh, they'll try to break through the fence. There'll be all kinds of problems um, that, that people thought were normal in, in cattle but if you can show them that this is a portable thing, then it never is the pasture. It never is that gate. It never is the tarp uh, because they can, re, they can reset. Uh, so um, don't, don't give up hope. Uh, your horse is designed to reset their nervous system. And I would start to go back and play like with the realization that horses can be like clever haunts that that if you can ignore those oh no things and still get somewhere with your horse and say, well, they're learning, but you've got those oh no braces in there some still. And those can come back to haunt you. Those guarded areas, those times your horse asked you if they were safe and you decided that you really weren't gonna answer that question. This is my, uh, my website, horsebrainscience.info. <clears throat> um, I have a, a, a full seminar, Your Horse's Brain, a User's Manual. It's six hours worth. I did this with, with Mark Rashid and Jim Masterson. So there's some of his body work in there. There's some work where Mark is showing uh, some of these ideas applied to a uh, to a horse. Uh, there's also a horse brain dissection in there that I go through step by step and, and, and talk about. Uh, so I've done a lot of uh, dissection, but I think you're right, Wendy, in that, uh, you know, Martin and I, when it was really excited, when we really got excited when we realized we were on the same page. We were asking similar questions. His was just empirical, applied, and mine was neurological and what was happening in the nervous system. And then I start hearing this from uh, guys like Jim Masterson who say, no, I noticed these things in the horse's body, in their, their physiology, I see these things. And so 
it's almost like this paradigm shift, yeah. you know, where we're, we're becoming more and more aware and holy mackerel, you know, we are, we've been so crude and insensitive over time. Well, we get by with what we, we know, but it's amazing that where we're finding we can go uh, with horses. And you know what? You may be in a hurry, but it's going slower that helps you go faster. You get farther along. And, and Martin used to, his grandfather used to tell him things like, don't let the horse win a fight. And so I, I would talk to Martin about that. And so, you know, he began to realize that we're at a point right now where, of diminishing returns. I can only make this worse if I keep after you. So tomorrow when I come to get you, I can so say I won the fight, but you're going to be twice as bad tomorrow because we, we had to get there through a fight. And what I find is that if I say, okay, partner, you're having a tough time of this. I'm having a tough time of this. Let's just back up and do something you know how to do simply. And then I'll just put you away and let's just defuse the whole situation. And he'd say those horses were twice as good the next day because he didn't feel like he had to go through that old myth of having to boss his horse around, having to win, having to show them who's boss, having to be the alpha, having to be the leader. <clears throat> Horses know that you're not a horse. I hate to break it to you. They know you're not a horse. So what we can, the best way we can do is learn to understand their language and how they, they work. You know, if your horse speaks French and you speak English, it doesn't help if you yell in English. No. Right? <laughs> right? You're not getting your point across. So it really is all about communication, all about being aware of your nervous system and your horse's nervous system and reaching this titration of comfort and how fast you can grow and how much your horses seem to learn and, and how your horses respond, you know? And I, and I think in that too, Stephen, that we're all destined to make mistakes and the mistakes don't have to be ruinous. They're just mistakes. And their learning experiences, because no one is going to get this perfect. <laughs> that we didn't come with a manual to get it perfect. We came with a manual to learn. <laughs> right. There's no perfect teacher. There's no perfect parent, right? And what I like to say is, and the same as medicine, we don't do what we did 50 years ago. Why? We know things are different. We might look and cringe at something we did in the past, but every horse that I interact now benefits from every horse I've interacted with and all the mistakes I've made. The idea is just not to make the same mistakes and know I went down a, a path that probably wasn't in the horse's best interest. Right. But this way of thinking helps your horse's welfare, helps your horses, you know, benefits your horse by, by allowing brain growth. And you know, it benefits you because you're more effective, you're more consistent, you're more aware. Um, it, and, you know, this is fascinating work. It's not A, B, C, D, get after them with the carrot stick, et cetera. This is a communication mm -hmm. back and forth with a creature that has a nervous system and lots of variables in there. But if you, if you can answer that question for your horse, it might say, just see how you'll get it. Well, and I also think it's an excellent model for how we interact with each other. And, and I think more times than we want to acknowledge there, when people are interacting, there's going to be the same, am I safe? Am I afraid? Are you a threat? And, and we don't even realize those conversations are going on, but like with the pandemic now, that is a lot of the conversation when we go into a restaurant or go outside of our pod or, interact with other people. And so we're, we get an opportunity to feel more like a horse asking those questions than we would ever have any other time in our life. Yeah. Yeah. And just keep learning. Yeah. Just be open-minded and know, you know, so many times in the past, long ago, I would ask somebody and they'd say, well, that's the way we've always done it. And I'd say, mm. well, well, why have you always done it that way? Why have you ever tried this way? And they say, no. And I say, well, why not? And they say, 
oh, because that's bullshit. Well, there's a really <laughs> great, great response. <clears throat> but how far can we ever get? I mean, we wouldn't know many of the things we know, you know, now. We didn't know that these, what we called, you know, whiskers were actually sensory organs. We didn't know, you know, how sensitive horses actually were, you know. We didn't know that we could cause these traumas that we, we, we cause. Um, you know, we are really going, coming a long way in, in being able to look at our horse. <clears throat> these pictures here, <clears throat> these are, this was a German group and they used what's called a three Tesla magnet. One of the, the most sophisticated uh, MRIs that we've ever used for horses. And they pictures of horse brains. They just sort of took a slice, picture, picture, moving front to back, side to side, top to bottom. And then a computer put them all together. So we are now able to start looking at three-dimensional models of horses' brains, of individual horses. Their goal is to eventually get to a point where we can use what's called functional MRI with a horse whereby functional MRI is an MRI that's so sophisticated, we can take a picture of the horse's brain in real time. So if I tell you a joke and I see you laughing, I can see where in your nervous system, what areas of the brain are lighting up as you're appreciating this joke. So that's how rapid these uh, pictures can be in terms of brain function. Can you imagine? a point where almost like a helmet, like a, in a beauty parlor, we put that on our horse and we interact with our horse and we know exactly what, how what we do responds, how it responds with the horse. And every horse is gonna be a little different, so we fine tune it. But science is getting us to some incredible places and it only can benefit the horse. You know, the horse is finally getting a voice where they can say, well, this is how it affects me. Mm. And we can then be aware of, of their welfare, their well-being. And some people may say that's not important, but to me that, that is the horse's overall well-being. You know, they last longer, they have a, a better life. If they're not having a bunch of uh, stress hormones carousing through their system, if their nervous systems aren't shutting down. So that's where we're going. And so, this is the so I have a question about this. How do they, how did they do it? Like, what did it look like? Do they have like this giant machine and they walk the horse in and he puts his head in it or, you know? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's how you can do this. Here they wanted, in this case, what they wanted is no movement artifact because you've got to hold still. That's one right. of the problems still, right? Uh, so sometimes, you know, somebody gets nervous in the MRI machine, they have to go back and take another series of pictures because they're moving around there. Hey, buddy, stay still. This particular horse was an eight-year-old that uh, fractured its, its uh, leg so badly that it had to be euthanized. So the scientists knew about, um, <clears throat> or, or these people knew about these scientists and so they were kind of on the lookout for a horse. Uh, as soon as they euthanized this horse, within 90 minutes, they had the, they dissected at, you know, I think C3, C4. They, they dissected out and put the horse's head in the MRI and started taking these sophisticated pictures. So there was no movement artifact. Okay. But um, down below, I don't know if you can see my little arrow, but the cerebellum, the spinal cord, oh, yeah. the brain stem, the corpus callosum that holds both hemispheres together. You know, we can visualize, here's an area, the optic chiasm, where the, these are optic nerves. So the eye would be here and here. The optic nerve comes together, crosses at the chiasm. So what the horse sees out here in this visual field actually crosses over to the other side of the brain and vice versa. So that's a myth that some people have is that, oh, if they see it on this side of the brain, they're not seeing it on the other side. No, it actually crosses over. So our understanding of the neuroanatomy answers lots of questions for us as well.
Somebody Brave told me world. what the size of a horse's brain is, but I, I know from your dissection, it depends on the size of the horse. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but in general, uh, I would think of a really good sized grapefruit would be about the size of the, the horse's brain. And then this area on the back here, the cerebellum is larger in the horse because the cerebellum's responsibility is timing, fine motor movements, sequencing, all of that happens back there in the cerebellum. So just keeping a horse on the diagonal, just in a horse's trotting, keeping track of all those movements, all takes place back there in the, in the cerebellum. So the cerebellum is probably as big as a tangerine and the horse's brain is probably as big as a big grapefruit. Those are awesome pictures. <laughs> see where oh here's dendrites oh yay <laughs> so growing dendrites is learning so here you can see if you give your horse opportunities let them solve problems even if they're wrong we know that in the process of solving a problem setting it up so that your horse has to solve a problem actually creates more dendrites and so you get more growth you get a smarter horse with more options, and they don't always have to default back to just uh, self-preservation response if they have other avenues. So go out there and make your horse a big brain. Yeah. This is basically the reticular activating system that I talked about that, that you have input coming from the eyes, from the olfactory bulbs, uh, from the vestibular system, all bombarding your horse and vying for their attention. Here's what you want the horse to look like with sympathetic arousal. This is not a horse that's panicking. You know, some people get their horse so comfortable that, that, that they can't learn because they're not with you. So this horse here is about perfect where you'd want your horse to be to learn new information. These horses are in the parasympathetic nervous system, head below the withers. If I said, hey, horses, here's what we're gonna do. They're not gonna pay any attention to me. They're checked out. If we put on too much pressure, then they zone out and they can't pay attention to us. So the idea is just to, we wanna aim for that, that look right there, if we can, in our learning situations. And lastly, there's Martin and I moving some cows around. Those horses are pretty relaxed. We're not yeehawing anybody around. In fact, if you look, I, I left the I left the uh, bridle in the in the barn <laughs> because I thought it was too nice. You know, I didn't know that Martin wanted me to take his his nice bit. So uh, once we got there, he said, "Hey, where's your where's your bit?" And I said, "Well, I don't have it." So. We're still able to move cows around. If you look, I just took the lead line and made a made reins out of it. So you don't have to have your horse jumping around and acting crazy and a bunch of heavy stuff on their face to get them to do what you need them to do if your communication's good. There's Martin and I doing a brain dissection early on, and there's our book, which you can find on Amazon. Yep. Or horse brain science.info. Wendy, as always, it's great to, to chat with you and catch up. I'll have some new information the next time we do this. Yeah, this is fabulous. Just unshare your screen there and we'll we'll wrap this up. It's, uh, it's, it's always fun to listen to you, Stephen. There's always something new and another slide and another way of looking at it. And um, I just really appreciate you being there because you've just helped so many people understand how their horse learns and thinks. So it's made just a huge difference in a lot of horses' lives. And I know I race through this and throw big terms out there, but even just hearing it and exploring it a little bit and just slowing down in your interaction with your horse and trusting what your horse is saying to you, you know, in developing this conversation with your horse uh, will pay big dividends. So I, and your students are always great. I always see these questions pop up one after another. You, you get a lot of sharp people here tuning in. Well, we've been, you know, I, this is, uh, I've done over 150 webinars now and we have a lot of regular people tuning in to watch them. 
And um, it's been fascinating because I keep getting emails all the time about how much people appreciate my guests. And I, you know, I'm, I couldn't do this without you guys, without you. And it's just great to be able to help people and get that feedback and know how much we're helping people with their horses. So I, I can't thank you enough for coming back. I will call on you again, probably about six months because I'm gonna just keep going with this and see where you where you are this summer and how things are going. Well, thank you, Wendy, and thank you to everybody. Uh, and go out there and just ask for the best evidence from your horse and keep up the good work. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Um, tomorrow is Friday already. The weeks just keep rolling by. And I'll have my Surefoot webinar at 1 o'clock. So see you then. And thanks again, Peter. Take care. Bye.